welcome to this class on hardware security so today we shall be starting a new topic we shall be starting to discuss on what is called as micro architectural attacks which basically is kind of the confluence of architecture or computer architecture and its effect on security of ciphers or cipher implementations so we shall be starting this uh, discussion with uh, a quick discussion about what is meant by micro architectural leakages we shall be trying to talk about timing channels in cryptography which is a very important aspect to understand to realize an end to end secured implementation. Uh, we shall be discussing in particular about cache attacks and timing channels created using cache memories and then we, we shall be talking about the types of cache attacks and then finally cache timing attacks on AES. Uh, we intend to also discuss about cache timing attacks on small table ciphers and their impact on of uh, and the impact of techniques like parallelization and out of order loading. And finally, we shall wrap up with a case study on a cipher called Clefia, like a, a basically a cache timing attack on a Clefia, which is a very, which is again a standard block cipher. So, uh, first, let us have a quick look on uh, the, you know, the, the the effect of microarchitectures on security. So, uh, computer architecture has been fundamentally designed with performance as a primary design criteria, and security has always been an afterthought. For example, we have various techniques like speculative execution, uh, execution which is an optimization technique where a computer system performs some tasks that may not be needed. So, this essentially has been the basis of several attacks leading to uh, a very famous attack which has recently been discovered which is called as uh, which is called as spectre and meltdown. So, uh, so this is the reference of this attack and this basically kind of shook the world and uh, took the world uh, or most of the most part of the world by surprise. And to wrap up uh, or to quote Bruce Schneier, who is a very famous security uh, expert and security commenter, commentator, uh, fixing them either requires a patch that results in a major performance hit or is impossible and requires a re-architecture of conditional execution in future C CPU chips. So, this is essentially extremely difficult because at this point after so many years of evolution of computer architecture and techniques of how to handle such kind of executions or speculative execution, it is kind of you know like that we have to go back 20 years. So, this essentially makes the entire scenario quite uh, dangerous. So, all this happens primarily because you know like the most even now when we kind of find out or develop a new technique, our primary goal has been performance. So, security right essentially cannot be an afterthought and these kind of attacks again and again tell us that we need to have proper design for security criteria. So, uh, so there are you know like, uh, so, 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 so how do you kind of model microarchitecture? So, this becomes extremely complicated because of you know the fact that in when we run our processes on computers, then there are so many complicated uh, things which happen, there are so many complicated interactions that modeling of such kind of attacks becomes extremely challenging and difficult. For example, when we have talked previously about side channel attacks where our primary focus was like power and electromagnetic radiations, we found that you know like we can actually uh, although not exactly accurate, but we can essentially fairly model them by uh, methodologies like having distance or having weights of the internal states. On the other hand leakage right in when we talk about computers or you know like computing systems can be actually a function of several parameters. For example, it could be because of the branch prediction algorithms, it could be because of hyper threading, it could be your memory technology, it could be your memory hierarchy, it could be the cache memory or the cache memory architecture and so many there are so many other things which can be of direct consequence or direct impact on the on, on micro architectural leakages. So, our focus in today's talk is primarily on cache attacks and uh, in particular about the timing channel which is created. Uh, due, to, due, due to the existence of cache memories. So, therefore, right if we take a little bit of look and uh, uh, try to understand why cache memories create a timing channel in cryptography. So, let us try to illustrate this by this uh, diagram. So, you can see there are again the two, two members like Alice and Bob who are essentially participating in a communication where you know like Bob essentially is using a cipher and because of that right he uses a secret key. The secret key essentially is embedded in its own computing system and therefore, right the idea is that the adversary should not definitely have access to the secret key because then the entire security collapses. Now, we can pretty much assume that the computing system on which Bob is working is the general purpose machine 
which probably from the von Neumann's model has essentially a look like this. So, it is essentially you have got a main memory, you have got a microprocessor, but we know that there is a memory wall and therefore, you can pretty much e expect that in order to bridge this memory wall, there is an intermediate cache memory which is essentially tries to apply uh, you know like appear as a staircase between the memory and the microprocessor. So, therefore, right now imagine that the adversary right who is basically observing this channel or the communication channel which is untrusted has definitely access to the input and the output. But along with it right imagine that the adversary also has the capability of very accurately monitoring time and measure time or monitor time. So, now the objective of the adversary is again like any attacker or most attackers is to obtain Bob's secret key. And now basically the attacker wants to use this time as a channel or a covert channel for understanding what is the internal secret and therefore, the question is why is time a channel for information leakage. So, if we just take a look back or just remember about our old uh, our classical textbooks in computer architecture, we have all seen this that if there is a cache hit and if there is a cache miss then there is a difference in timing. For example, if the data is available in the cache memory, then you would expect that the access time of a particular memory access would be less. Whereas, right, if there is a cache miss, then there are more maneuvering which happens which results in a larger, larger access time because you access the primary memory or the main memory which is seemingly much slower compared to your cache memory. So, imagine that the attacker is able to distinguish between a cache hit and a cache miss because of the ability to measure time very accurately. And then this ability to, to understand whether an access is essentially resulted in a cache hit or it resulted in a cache miss can apparently reduce the entropy of the secret key. So, uh, so in order to again understand that let us try to take a look about uh, at a specific type of example which falls into the class of what are called as time driven cache attacks. So, again like uh, observe that suppose you have a cipher like AES for example in which there are different parts of the key. For example, K0 and K1 here are symbolic or K0 and K4 here are symbolic of two parts of the key. Both of them, both of them are getting kind of you know like exhort with your plain text. For example, K0 is getting exhort with P0 which is a part of the plain text again and again P4 is getting exhort with the part which is K4 and uh, both of them are creating a virtual address which is say P0 exhort with K0 and here in this case it is P4 exhort with K4. So, now imagine that the cipher has been implemented with lot of tables and I will come to this point subsequently a little bit more details, but imagine at this point that the cipher has been implemented using tables and therefore, right you make an access at this table at the location or address which is P0 exhort with K0 and here you make an access at P4 exhort with K4. So, therefore, right the adversary is making two independent accesses. Now, if you kind of remember about for example, the AES structure in which there were 16 parts like when I talk about AES 128, there are 16 parts of the key. Okay. The idea is that each part of the key is independent and therefore, right the entropy is proportional to 16 multiplied by 8 that is 128 bits. That means, right that K0 or K4 and K0 and K4 they to be they should be two independent components of the key. That means, that if I give you the knowledge of K0 you basically have no information about K4 and vice versa. Okay. But now we will see how using a timing channel and you know like just understanding that whether uh, there is a cache sheet or a cache miss can significantly reduce the entropy of the key or the key material. For example, if that so again you know like the adversary like in most attacks has got a control of the input we assume that. So, it can basically send pretty much P0 and P4 and can also observe the timing by using a very accurate timing channel. So, now suppose the adversary is able to understand that there is a cache hit by understanding that suddenly you know like he finds that there is an access time. So, I, so what happens is that there, is, there are two accesses which happens here. So, the first access for example, happens in this uh, happens in this table right. So, therefore, this is your uh, access 1. So, this is your access 1 and this is the second access which happens here in this table. So, these two accesses are seemingly independent. But imagine right that the attacker is, is able to find that the access which happens to the second table takes a very takes very small amount of time and therefore, he suspects that it resulted in a cache hit. Okay. So, now like in most of these discussions right that we do we will assume that the cipher starts with an initial cache warming which means that initially there is no data available in the cache. So, I would expect that any the so first access definitely resulted in a cache miss. And but, but the second one can be a cache hit or a cache, cache miss 
and suppose the attacker by, the, by its ability to measure time accurately kind of comprehends that there was a cache hit. So that immediately tells us that the address at which the you know like the access had happened okay uh, essentially right if I just assume a very simplistic model of the cache and if I initially assume that there is only one element in the cache line then I can directly write that the XOR of P0 and K0 is same as that of the XOR of P4 and K, K4 that means these two XORs are exactly the same. Even if I assume that you know like there are multiple values in the cache line then you know, I, as, as I know that what happens is in the virtual address the position in the cache line is essentially kind of you know like understood by the lower significant bits of the virtual address. So that means right if there is uh, something which goes into a cache line then I would kind of uh, so let me make an assumption that I am not able to distinguish between what goes into uh, or, or uh, between the bytes which or between the elements which goes into a cache line that means right I will be able to recover a certain part of uh, certain part of the of, of, of the address. So that means I can only tell that in that case right that uh, maybe you know like the the, the, the few the, uh, the few bits of the uh, of the address essentially resulted in the same uh, same same value that means what what can probably happen in that case right that when i find that there is a cache hit i can probably tell that the xor of p0 and k0 and if i take the lsb for example or few lsbs of depending upon how many you know like uh, for example right if there are like 64 bytes then it may happen that 6 uh, bits are used to kind of index that then that means right the last 6 bits that means the 6 LSBs of P0 XOR with K0 is same as that of uh, P4 XOR with K4 ok. So that means that uh, so just let me just write 6 LSB for example to indicate the least significant bits ok. So that means right uh, it implies that I am not able to recover the entire address but at the same time like definitely few few bits of the address ok. So that basically, so, so let us, if, if I even if I you know like forget this uh, complication right now and just assume that there is one element in the cache line, then I can just write that the XOR of P0 XOR with K0 is same as that of P4 XOR with K4 and therefore I can write that the XOR of K0 XOR with K4 is same as that of P0 XOR with P4. So what does that tell us? That tells us that K0 and K4 are now not independent. That means if I have a knowledge of K0, then I know the value of K4, okay. So therefore, right, it implies that uh, essentially what it implies is that now if we assume that the entropy of K0 was initially n bits and the entropy of K4 was initially also n bits, that means initially we are at 2 n bits of entropy. Now because of this uh, information leakage, this suddenly shrinks to n, okay. In a more realistic scenario where I consider multiple cache lines, okay, so there, uh, so there what will happen is that suppose initially you had an entropy of 2 n that will reduce to n plus delta. So that delta essentially is because of the fact that in a cache line there are uh, multiple uh, multiple uh, values uh, which I am not able to discriminate. So I essentially I will not have information about those bits ok. But at the same time right definitely there is an information leakage because of this and therefore that implies that this can be potentially dangerous. Even if there is a cache miss that means you know like suppose an access takes more time I can in that case write an inequality where it means that the XOR of P0 and K0 is not equal to the XOR of P4 and K4 even that is a leakage because that tells us that K4 cannot take certain values which is also equivalent to the leakage of, uh, of the unknown key. So therefore right in both cases we see even if there is a cache hit or if there is a cache miss there is a potential leakage which we need to kind of take care of. So depending upon you know like different kinds of cache attacks or the, you know like different uh, or the presence of cache there are different types of cache attacks which has been defined. So here is a quick uh, sort of uh, you know like uh, uh, quick uh, 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 nomenclature of some important class of attacks. For example we have got cache trace attacks, we have got cache access attacks and we have got cache timing attacks. So let us take a quick look in between them. So the cache trace attack essentially stands for the fact that suppose I do a simulation and I basically somehow you know like uh, for all the accesses that a block cipher makes I am able to kind of understand whether they resulted in a cache hit or a cache miss. For example right if I implement AES uh, and in particular the AES S box as a, a, a table then that means right for example every round of AES uh, makes 16 lookups or 16 table accesses. So if there are like 10 rounds then I would expect that there are 160 accesses that the AES uh, is making 
or the 160 table access that AES is making. So now, now what I am trying to kind of do is, I am trying to kind of do a trace analysis uh, by you know like measuring maybe that power consumption of the system and, and I am assuming that if there is an, ex, uh, so suppose you know like I, uh, there is a cache miss, then that results in a shoot in the power line. So what happens is that if I observe the power line and I, I see several access, uh, access, then and suddenly if I get a kind of overshoot, then I reckon that or suspect that that, that is because of a cache miss. Okay. So, if I have got this ability, then for all this 160 accesses in AES, I am able to know, you know, like the pattern of hits and misses. So, what may happen is that the first access is a miss, then I get a hit, then there is a miss, there is a hit and so on. So, you know, like I have got a trace, I have got a history of, you know, like whether the, the accesses resulted in a cache hit or a cache miss. So, this class of analysis or this class of uh, attacks basically what they do is, they take this cache trace in as an input. Then they take the block cipher and then they make an analysis to understand whether they, they can use this extra information to, to retrieve the key. Okay. So, these class of attacks are what are called as cache trace attacks. So, there is another class of attack which is called as cache access attacks and probably it is a little bit more common or more well known which essentially resulted from a work by OSFIC and therefore it can be referred also as OSFIC's attack. So, what it does is basically it uses a spy program to determine the cache behavior. So, it is kind of an attack where we assume that both the target or the victim and the attacker or the spy is essentially co-resident and is working on the same hardware platform. It can pretty much happen particularly right because of the advent of cloud and other infrastructure which we often share with our adversaries. So, in this case what happens is that initially the spy makes an access to the microprocessor. So, it kind of fills the cache memory with some garbage data and then it allows the AES to execute. So, when the AES executes, it of course makes certain accesses and that implies that it kind of evicts some uh, locations from the cache memory and therefore, when the spy comes back again and executes and remember that uh, since the spy is, uh, you know like when the spy is executing and uh, it can again, it, it remembers the accesses, accesses where it originally made and therefore, it can time its own access because you know like you are, so the, the spy is not really timing the you know like the accesses which AES was making, but is timing the access, accesses which it is, it is itself making. Okay. So, therefore, right what will happen is that since these locations where you know when the spy comes up and if it finds that the time is more, then it will potentially suspect that there is a cache miss which means right the AES has evicted those. Uh, uh, those locations, uh, those locations from the cache memory, and therefore it kind of you know you know will, will give us the footprint of the AES execution, where where AES executed and where AES did not execute. Okay, and therefore right now we can combine this with something that we already saw that right, when we basically build those equations of P0 exot with K0 equal with maybe P0 exot with K1 or is not equal to P0, P1 exot with K1, and from there right can basically reduce the entropy of the entire AES 120. So, therefore, right this essentially uh, is quite a devastating attack and these kind of attacks are often called as the prime plus probe attacks. So, now there are uh, different variants of as I said different variants of cache attacks. There is another very important class of attacks which is called as cache timing attacks and this is even more powerful because uh, it basically kind of claims that it can uh, potentially work over the network and essentially therefore can be used to attack a remote server potentially. So, this again you know like straight from the textbook, we remember that if I ask you right that there is a bunch of instructions and then uh, uh, you know like what is the execution time because of that, then our textbook tells us that if the access time for the cache memory is th and if the access time for the cache I mean when there is a miss right is tm and if the number of hits is nh and the number of miss is tm uh, is nm then the total execution time is, is, is obtained by multiplying nh with th and when we add N, nm with tm plus some noise. This k stands for some uh, things which I am not able to exactly model. And now imagine that uh, what uh, this is the scenario of the attack. So, basically there is a remote server which is running an encryption software and there is a remote attacker who basically establishes a network. So, this could be potentially even by something as common as, by, as, a, as a TCP network and then basically sends packets to the server to encrypt and then when the server sends back the cipher text 
Along with it, it also obtains the timestamp or the time of obtain, you know, sending the data and receiving the packet back. That means, you know, like it basically tries to do a statistical analysis or the attacker tries to do a statistical analysis to know what is the time which the encryption took uh, in, in the remote server. And then it basically tries to kind of do a statistical analysis to retrieve the key from there. So this as you can see right is a quite uh, you know like a very practical attack model because apparently right, it can potentially work on over the network. So as we will see in more details right in this class of attacks we actually make also an assumption. The assumption is that the attacker has an access to a similar looking software or similar looking server okay, with exactly the same specifications which it has pre-characterized. Okay. So, you basically can in, the, in that particular target server, it can therefore make a characterization with an, uh, with an example of a known key okay. and then it basically targets the victim server where the key is not known. So, it is kind of sim similar to uh, the template attacks that we have seen in the context of side channel attacks. So, this paper or this work was primarily uh, initiated by Dan Bernstein in a work in 2005 which showed that how we can perform a cache timing experiment. So, let us try to understand this with the example of AES. So, in AES as we know that so in particular AES 128 we know that there are 16 bytes of input or plain text. So, what we do is we take one of the bytes for example say P0 and I want to obtain the value of K0 that means the first byte of the secret key. So, therefore, the remaining part that means the remaining 15 bytes of the key I, I make them I, I make several iterations of them ok. So, therefore, what I do is I initially fix the value of P0 and for the remaining 15 bytes I just make large number of variations. So, I probably I, I, I make 2 power of 15 choices of the remaining uh, remaining uh, plain text bytes and then I, I, I apply it uh, you know I apply the AES engine on those plain text. And then I also observe the timing corresponding to each of these encryptions and then I take the global I, I take the I take the average of all these encryption times ok. And then I plot them in the form of a, of, of, of a timing characteristic. So, what I do is I basically take all the values of P0. So, initially suppose P0 is 0 and then I basically make 2 power of 15 variations of the remaining 15 bytes. I get the average timing I plot that average time ok. Likewise, I again change the value of P0 to something else and then you know like I, I again I apply 2 power of 15 randomly chosen values of the inputs keeping this this value of P0 as constant ok uh, to maybe 1 and then I again obtain an average uh, several timings and then I take the average of that ok and then I plot that. So, then what I do is I, I essentially can kind of you know like pretty much fix P0 to all the 256 values and then I obtain this graph which is like which is called as a timing characteristic of the 0th byte ok. Note that when I am observing this timing in order to remove the effect of noise what I do is instead of plotting or you know like plotting the average time I also compute the global average and then I deduct the global average from that individual average time ok. So, therefore, right this is just a denoising technique and therefore, we obtain the characteristic of the plain text byte B0 and as, as, as written here we obtain the deviation from the mean time that means from the global mean time. So, it is very interesting to see this timing characteristic for example, you can see that there are certain bundles ok and potentially these bundles are because you know like uh, there are some data in the in the cache line which are difficult to distinguish and therefore, they have a similar kind of timing behavior. So, now what uh, what we do is that again as, as you remember that in the cache timing attack model we assume that there is a target server where you can do a templating process which means you can fix the key to 0, you can derive a timing characteristic as we have seen and then now you make a target that means you do not know the key and therefore, you repeat this experiment and then again obtain the characteristic. So, you will find that the characteristics in both cases are pretty simple except that the one of them is a shift of the other. So, if you are able to measure the shift by applying some kind of standard correlation technique right and if you correlate these two results then potentially you get the 0 key byte because you basically get the XOR of this key and this key and since this key is held to 0 you actually get the unknown key ok. So, therefore, the shift is what we measure and the shift essentially stands for your unknown secret key ok. So, so therefore, this is a very uh, interesting attack and therefore, right people have kind of tried to anal analyze why cache attacks work on AES. So, for that right let us just recollect the structure of AES this is the structure of AES 
and uh, the, then we have to kind of understand how do we implement AES for software. So for that, right, we note that this byte substitution is or can be implemented potentially as 16 bytes from a 256 byte lookup table, okay. And uh, in fact, right, you can actually implement using bigger tables, okay. So if you just look, uh, take a look into OpenSSL, which is a repository of several cryptographic implementations. And if you look into the implementation of AES, then you will find that it is implemented or every round is implemented using four lookup tables, okay. For example, let the input of the round transformation be denoted by A and the output of the sub bytes by B. Then we know that every byte uh, like the input byte is basically getting modified by the S box of Rindal or AES into say BIJ. So AIJ here stands for the input and BIJ stands for the output. Again, as you can understand that uh, I can vary from 0 to 4 and J can vary from 0 to 4. So NB here stands for 4 and therefore we have got a six, uh, 16 cross 16 byte wise organization of AES as we have already previously seen. So now if we apply the shift rows, then we know that every byte here gets shifted. For example, this is essentially uh, B0, J plus C0. So C0 for the 0th row stands for 0 because in the 0th row there is no shift. For the second row, there is a shift by one location. So C1 stands for 1, C2 stands for 2 and C3 stands for 3. So therefore, right, this column stands for B0, comma J plus 0, that is J. This stands for B1, J plus 1. This stands for B2, J plus 2. And this stands for B3, J plus 3. And therefore, right, if in that way, you basically accommodate the shift rows operation. And then you have to perform a mixed columns. The mixed column basically performs on this particular column. And you basically multiply this matrix, which is already pre-known. You multiply with this particular column and you get the values of Ds. Okay? So this is essentially your output. So now the question is, right? you can definitely write a code where I do these operations individually, but it turns out that it, in software it becomes much more efficient if we can implement the entire mapping by lookups. Okay? So therefore right here what we do is, is illustrated over in this particular slide. So you can see that what we need to do is this because this essentially is nothing but SRD applied on the corresponding input bit. So SRD stands for the S box of AES or S box of Rindal. So therefore, right, any byte here like this column for example can be obtained by multiplying this column like 21113 with this byte. Okay? So this is the byte standing for the 0th value or the 0th row. And likewise the second element and then you exhort this with this column that is 3212 uh, multiplied by uh, this should be 32111 uh, actually. Okay? So I, I should uh, multiply 3211 here. So let me correct this. This is 3211. Okay? 3211. So we basically multiply this column with this byte and that is, is, is essentially shown over here. Okay? Likewise you multiply this column with this byte and that is shown in over here and finally you multiply this column with this byte and that is shown here. Okay? So note that each of these lookups essentially takes a 256 bit input, I mean an 8 bit input and results in a 32 bit output. Okay? And these mappings can be shown here as 4 tables T0, T1, T2 and T3 and this essentially stands for lookups where the input is 8 bits and the output is uh, 32 bits. Okay? So therefore it turns out that every table here takes 1 kilobyte amount of memory and therefore totally right it takes 4 kilobytes amount of memory. So therefore the AES in OpenSL essentially has been implemented using these tables and that implies that there are 4 table accesses that you are doing per round. Okay? And that implies that if you take 9 rounds, remember the last round cannot be implemented in this way because in the last round there is no mixed columns. So therefore right you are making uh, 4 into 9, uh, 4 into 9 that is 36 accesses of various lookups. Okay? So there is a significant amount of cache activity that happens because of these kind of implementations which can be targeted by the attacks that we are currently discussing. So therefore right I mean uh, so if you do this then uh, potentially uh, what we what so if you now take th therefore you know like try to execute uh, AES with this 4 kilobyte table implementation and consider two different runs of the encryption. So remember if I just kind of store that as nt as a total number of uh, you know, accesses, then we know that nt is nothing but the summation of the number of misses 
plus the number of hits in an axis. So therefore, nt is a constant, right? Because the total number of axes that you do to the tables remains a constant for that algorithm. So therefore, what I can do is I can replace nh with nt minus nm and therefore I can rewrite this equation as nt into th plus tm minus th into nm plus that constant k. So if I take two different runs of the encryption and if I kind of take the difference between these two runs, then this part would cancel because this part is a constant. I will only have an effect on or proportionality on the number of misses. Okay? And what we find is that if you take an ex do these experiments, that means if you take the number of misses and do a frequency plot, you will find that there is a nice distribution of the number of misses, which means that the number of misses varies across execution. And that is partly happening because you know like your table is big and therefore right uh, it may happen that you know like the entire table right essentially is creating this nice distribution and therefore because of this various variation in the number of misses you actually get varying times which can be exploited by the adversaries to know whether there is a cache hit or a cache miss and also to perform uh, you know like a correlation kind of attack that we see in the case of Bernstein's timing attack. On the other hand right it is very interesting to know so cache attacks right we kind of suspect will work because of this kind of varying execution time. What if I implement AES with a very small table like maybe a 256 byte that means I just implement the SBOX as table and the other things I do by computations. If you repeat this experiment then you can expect that the, now the number of misses will become a constant because this table size is now 256 and if you expect for modern caches right you will have a cache line size something like 64 then there will be like 4 number of misses that can happen. And therefore, right, uh, as we know that there are several axes that you are doing, like 36 axes, that means like 4 will remain a constant. That means every time you do this encryption, you will always get 4 misses. Okay? And therefore, the variation will go. So for example, if you make a plot now, you will find that around 4 you will get a peak and there will be no other things that will occur. Okay? So the question is, right, can you still do an attack on this because the encryption time looks like constant and therefore if you vary, then it seems that the cache attack becomes much more difficult. Okay? So now what we will study in the next discussion is that how we can still attack this kind of implementations. In particularly what we, should, we should, what we shall be discussing is that we shall be trying to look into some modern microarchitectural techniques which actually helps us in, uh, in doing attacks even in those cases. Okay? So that will take up in the next class and thanks for your attention.